Hello and welcome to another episode of Sensational She Geek live from Yancey Street. Today is Tuesday, July 6th, 2021, and this is episode 25A. I do apologize, as I normally would have an A episode for the week up on Monday. However, due to the holiday on the 4th, everything kind of got pushed back a little bit and things kind of got put off for a day or so, so I am doing the podcast on Tuesday. I apologize if you showed up Monday looking for that. It is just a day late, and it is going to be here. So thank you very much for showing up to listen to the podcast, as it is an A podcast for uh, what would normally be a Monday. We are going to start off with the comic book pull list. We have a good number of stuff that's very exciting, and three really cool number, well, four really cool number ones that I'm very excited to talk about. So we'll get to all of that in time. After that, we will discuss, as usual, the Bad Batch episode 10, titled Common Ground. This was a really f- cool episode. We had um, not quite as much action and, you know, death and things as we might usually have, but there's a lot of good things that happened and interesting things that happened, and we will talk about all of those when we get there. Finally, because there was not a whole lot of news for official things coming out this week, I know Marvel and DC have put out some of their solicitations for October, so hopefully we can talk about that coming up soon once those are all out with the rest of the kind of industry stuff. Um, but we will discuss for our news segment what I have today is a little bit of MCU speculation um, that I is I, honestly, for me, something I don't want to have happen, but a lot of people do. So we will discuss that because it did come back into relevancy again this morning. Thank you to social media and Mr. Hugh Jackman. So we will talk about that at the end of the episode. Uh, Before we get started here, as usual, you can find me across most social media platforms. On Instagram, I am Anna with the comics because that is my name and I have the comics. Uh, I do only post about comic books and... uh, on my posts, that is, and my stories, I will sometimes include cats and food. So it's it's pretty much all comic-related there. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, Savage She Geek. I don't use Twitter nearly as much as I do anything else. My website is sensationalshegeek.weebly.com. You have to have the .weebly in there because you will not get anywhere without it, and I don't pay for it, and that's why it's got that. Um, someday, someday it'll be an actual .com, and that'll be real exciting when that happens. But that is not today. Uh, on my website, you can find a year and a half plus worth of written, um, and when I write things, I have the time to, you know, think out my words so I don't say um and like and stuff like that quite as much in my writing, obviously. Um, but you can go through and check all of my reviews, pull lists, pick lists, things like that for about a year and a half before I transitioned to doing the podcast in kind of replacement of those. Um, so I do have also on my site, my podcast notes. I'm a week or so behind in that and I'll get those up today. I promise. Um, podcast notes are what I kind of work off of to not get super off track. When I do the podcast, I write things down and things that I remember I want to say throughout the week before each episode. And then I can reference all of that during the episode. And that I make available for, um, listeners and whatnot for anyone who just doesn't feel like listening to my voice and prefers to read or for anyone who is hearing impaired uh, so they can still keep along, keep up with what's going on um, in the comics industry and everything like that. Finally, this podcast is available anywhere that podcast stream except Pandora. Um, It is also available on YouTube if you uh, are into that kind of thing. YouTube, I also post comic book, or excuse me, action figure reviews and discussions. No, I have not put up the Wonder Woman, um, the Mezco Wonder Woman one yet, because I'm just very behind on things. Let's be honest. It's been a mess of a, of a 2021. Um, and hopefully I'm getting to a point here where I will have more resources to catch up with things. But while life is still a bit messy, I apologize, uh, that I don't, always follow through with, well, that I don't always get the things up in time when I say they do. Um, And uh, finally, before we get started with the actual podcast episode here, uh, I do have, I know I mentioned it on the last couple of episodes, I did go ahead and set up a podcast Patreon. I don't have anything really to give as rewards or incentives. It's the kind of thing where you could just go in and put whatever dollar amount you think is appropriate for a monthly amount. 
this is just the kind of thing that if you feel like the podcast is worth supporting, if you think it's worth the cost of a comic or a movie or whatever that, whatever you feel like is, you know, the entertainment that you get for it, uh, completely optional. I, you know, I'm not even sure if it's set up right. So it's, if you just search Sensational She Geek on Patreon, it should show up there. Let me know if it doesn't. Um, even if you're not going in there to give me money, I'm just curious because it has me logged in and I'm lazy and can't figure out how to check if it's working. So, um, that is available now as a resource to support the podcast if you are at all interested or are a fan of the podcast. Um, and again, for any amount of time that you do listen, thank you very much. So let's go ahead and kick things off. Like usual, if you are someone who prefers to skip over my comic book poll list this week and get straight into my discussion of The Bad Batch and whatnot beyond that, the point that you want to skip into, and I'm sorry, it is most of the episode that I talk about the comic book poll list, an hour and nine minutes. An hour and nine minutes. You want to jump to that point and I'll be wrapping up the poll list. I'm sorry. It's most of what this is, this episode is. Uh, there'll probably be just a short bit on The Bad Batch and uh, the MCU speculation after that. So go ahead and jump there if that's what you're looking for. In our comic book poll list this week, these are going to be things that are coming out uh, on the 6th and the 7th. And yes, today is the 6th. And again, I do apologize that this podcast episode is a day later than I normally would have it up on the Monday. Um, but these are things for DC Comics are already out. I'm sorry. Uh, but for everything else are going to be coming out tomorrow on the 7th. Uh, the things that I will be discussing kind of starting off with things that I feel are more of representation, we are going to be discussing Sensational Wonder Woman number five, Wonder Girl number two, America Chavez Made in the USA number four, The Good Asian number three, Carmen number five, Avengers number 46, which will be an interesting discussion, The Amazing Spider-Man Annual number two, Green Lantern number four, Hellions number 13, Fight, and then we'll, after, once we get to this point, we're, we have four number ones. I saved them to the end because I'm pretty excited about all of them. It's Fight Girls number one, Mamo number one, Ordinary Gods number one, and of course, X-Men number one. So that will be the... That is what we're covering today on the pull list. Let's go ahead and start off with Sensational Wonder Woman number five. Uh, if you are not familiar, the Sensational Wonder Woman series is an anthology series. It has a different creative team on each issue. Um, just just one story per issue. And then uh, each of the stories are supposed to kind of celebrate an aspect of Wonder Woman or Diana Prince's personality, her character, her history... There's 80 years of it, so there's just plenty of material to tap into. There's plenty of room to put your own material and your own stories in. So this has been a very fun series so far to follow along with and see what these creators come up with for Wonder Woman. And for the most part, they are primarily female creators. I think there was one or two issues where we had a male artist... But aside from that, it has been entirely female creators, which is really fun to see because I get so down, to be honest, when they come out with an anthology issue, it's a standard anthology issue, such as, let's say, the Green Lantern 80th anniversary, or 80th, wow, that would be nuts. Uh, not Green Lantern, it was not even that. Green Arrow is what I'm trying to go for here. The Green Arrow anniversary issue that came out, I believe, last week, uh, that I actually forgot to pick up, to be honest, um, says what I think about that character, I guess, or how much I care. Um, not a lot of women. You know, Marvel put out last year, or whenever it was, that giant size X-Men anniversary celebration issue, 30 some odd artists on it. I think three of them were female. It, it's, it's, it's very, um, not upsetting, but just you get kind of depressed not seeing that market being tapped the way that it should. You have, you know that there are all these female creators out there who are begging to get into the industry, but there's that goddamn wall and it's very hard to prove your worth to get over that wall um and that as someone who aspires to be in the comic industry myself is something that that's one of the reasons that it is very upsetting um depressing <laughs> to see it's you, you you want to involve yourself in this community you want to see uh, your place of open there and waiting for you 
but for the most part there isn't even a slot available um so whenever i see these projects that do focus more on women in comics i cling to them with dear life because <laughs> uh they give me what little amount of hope for the industry i have but anyway this week's since it was this month's sensational wonder woman number five and yes this was a digital first series so a lot of these have already been published i believe it is three digital issues to one comic book issue um i didn't read it digitally i don't i feel like anybody who does read them digitally isn't going to read it on paperback and vice versa i don't read it digitally because i read them on paper so um to each their own, I suppose. This issue is written by Amy Chu with art by Maria Laura Sanapo. And on that note, I apologize to anybody whose names I mispronounce and also to the listeners who have to hear me mispronounce them. For this issue, was a very interesting... Co- um, it, for me, it's a bit of an exciting um, solicitation idea that they're giving us here, and I'll get into that in a second. It says, Katie, a spirited 98-year-old woman, has escaped her nursing home. As her caregivers track her down, Katie recounts her World War II adventures alongside Wonder Woman. Really cute concept. Obviously, you have the um, most likely going to sound like a kooky old woman um, who goes off and wants to have her, you know, final adventure or whatever and recalls her story of her adventures in her youth it's a really familiar concept adding wonder woman in there makes it really a lot more fun and a lot more interesting um and then what i think about this or what i'm hoping is going to happen with this if you were not familiar with philip kennedy johnson's it was the future state superman worlds of war duo of issues by philip kennedy johnson that was one of the best, if not the best, oh gosh, there's a lot of Supermans that are actually really good. Most of them aren't canon, though. I, that's what I find from why I'm getting off track, but my DC stuff that I really, really, really like the best usually isn't canon. Um, kind of like these sensational Wonder Woman issues. They're not really canon. They're just fun Wonder Woman stories that are about who she is and stuff. Um, but anyway, Philip Kennedy Johnson's uh, Superman was brilliant. It, 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 it um... His, his future state Superman, it just, it captured the essence of Kal-El, Superman, Clark Kent, all in one ball, um, without him really being in the story. <laughs> so it was really, really nice. Um, and, and the way that it was, it was people who had interacted at some point, who had been, for the most part, they were all people who had been saved by Superman, telling their stories of what you know, what happened and how he was saved by them. He wasn't even there. They're just gathered around telling his stories from what happened with them. Um, and it's, it's a really beautiful issue. And so this having the old woman recalling her adventures with Wonder Woman, um, I would imagine how this is going to go is she's going to go along and Wonder Woman's in the modern day will probably catch up with her and take a moment to remember her and their times they had together. Um, I, I imagine this will be a bit of a heartstring tugging issue, which I'm totally cool with because if it's done well, give me all the feels that you can give me. Um, so I'm excited for this. I am not familiar much with Amy Chu or Maria Laura Sanapo, but um, it's nice to have another duo of female creators on the interior of a sensational Wonder Woman. It's nice to have sensational Wonder Woman back. Um, I think these first four issues have all been far more enjoyable to me than any of the canon Wonder Woman for the past I think ever <laughs> I haven't really ever enjoyed canon Wonder Woman um, I was really hoping Becky Cloonan and Michael Conrad's I would and I'm, maybe this next arc I will but this arc I, I genuinely disliked I won't say hated I genuinely disliked it um, I did not enjoy it so Sensational Wonder Woman, even though it's an anthology series, uh, it was digital first. It's not really canon. It's been a phenomenal Wonder Woman series to follow as a fan of the character. Speaking of, I guess, Amazons, Wonder Girl number two comes out this week by Joelle Jones with coloring by Jordi Belair because Joelle Jones does everything. She draws it, she writes it, she inks it. Jordi Belair just colors it and 
not to say that that's a small thing. She really absolutely knocks it out of the park. Jordi Belair is probably one of my top... She's, I mean, she's definitely among my top five favorite comic book colorists. And if you're sitting here wondering, wow, how is that something that you even, like, notice or remember? Please, please take some time to go through the next issue that you read, assuming it's not in black and white, and just appreciate the coloring. Just notice it. Um, th I swear to you, there are things among about comic books to appreciate that you never even realize if you just take the time and go through it. So, um, all of the love to Jordi Belair for her coloring in this and all of the fascinating, like mind blowing. I'm just so impressed by Joelle Jones and how well she's doing on this series, because not only is she doing just writing it, she's had to do a fair amount of research and looking into histories. And because this is a Brazilian wonder woman, she's from Brazil. Um, so in the modern era, you know, maybe back in the day, they wouldn't really think about it too hard. But in the modern era, we have things called fact checkers. <laughs> so while it's, you know, standard in comics to take mythologies of a certain uh, continent or country or society and kind of twist them to fit for comics, you still have to learn about the culture and everything in the modern era to kind of represent them in a good way. And to the best that I, that I have seen, um, Brazilian fans are head over heels in love with Yara Floor, which I am so happy to see uh, that they're happy with Joelle Jones, what, what Joelle Jones is doing with her. Um, this is issue two of I don't know, but I, I it's, it's not going to go on forever, but God, I wish it did. While we initially met Yara Floor in Future State Wonder Woman, it was a duo of issues. She was also in the Wonder Superman Wonder Woman duo of issues and the Justice League duo of issues. All of which were fairly good, uh, but Wonder Woman was, it was, it was something that was, um, it was a true work of art. It, it really was. And for issue one of Wonder Girl, we can expect exactly that level of quality in her Wonder Girl prequel, because this is basically Yara Floor starting her journey to become Wonder Girl, um, before becoming later on in history, Wonder Woman. Because at this point, when we when we start the series, she is a Brazilian American girl who was taken by her aunt and uncle, for or at least aunt from Brazil when she was very very young. She doesn't really remember much about, if anything, about her time there, um, and she was brought to like Idaho or something like that in the U.S. And so she's lived her whole life in Midwest U.S. Um, or whatever you might call it. It's Midwest, yeah. Um, and now she is taking a trip to Brazil to learn about her, uh, you know, her, her people's culture. So, uh, to, against her aunt's wishes as well. So that's, um, that's where we started things. The first issue ended off with her falling into a giant, uh, like it was like a river. Um, and she, on the tour, she fell into the river and she was kind of dragged down by what appeared to be a bullet whip, which is, we know is what she uses as her whip of choice as Wonder Woman. Um, Alpha, Alpha, Alpha. Wow. On that note, there is a fantastic, um, DC pride variant this for this Wonder Girl issue, which is Kevin Wada, um, with her bola whip, she's tossing it around behind her. Really, really fantastic. I'm a very big fan of Kevin Wada. You may recognize his art from the, uh, oh gosh, from the Charles Soule She-Hulk covers. He didn't do the interiors. He just did the covers. Um, and it, they became very, very well-known covers because they really were phenomenal. Um, and so definitely check out, um, his Wonder Girl cover for DC Pride because it is beautiful as everything Kevin Wada does and touches is. Um, so anyway, this is, this, this is going to be following whatever it is that's happening with this creature that is dragging her underwater. She clearly has a history here that she does not know about. So here is the solicitation. After receiving a sacred gift from the gods of Brazil, our heroes seem destined for great things. Our hero seems destined for great things. Little does she know, another pantheon has been watching her as well. Hera, the queen of the Greeks, has chosen Yara to become her latest champion. But what does the goddess have, have for a warrior of her own? Find out in this stirring issue. What? But what need does the goddess have for... Okay, that, that made sense now. Okay. Um, we know from the first issue that... There are several groups who are interested in Yara's existence. Uh, we have the, what is it, Bana Migdal? 
Amazonians, we have the Amazonians of Themyscira, and then we have Hera, <laughs> who I thought at one point she had been like their um, like goddess of choice or whatever, um, patron goddess, I guess. She also has a need for um, Yara, but it would appear, based on the first issue, that she wants Yara to take down... Um, presumably the Themyscira and Amazons. Um, she seems to have some kind of plan to stab them in the back, possibly the Bonham McDowell ones as well. I'm not really sure how it all ties in together yet, but we're going to get some more information on that in this issue, and I am just completely stoked for it. Um, this is done, like I said, the, the interiors, the cover, the writing, the inking is all done by Joelle Jones. However, she will only be doing all of that for these first three issues. This is issue two. There's going to be one more after this with her on the interiors. Issue four and five have, you know, stupendously Adriana Mello as the interior artist, which is, you probably have me thinking about artists. You probably have two artists who are all kind of on the same level of Joelle Jones with their like seductive inking and just un mind-blowingly, unbelievably beautiful art. And um, that would be uh, Elena Casagrande, currently on Black Widow, and Adriana Mello, who I'm familiar with from Female Furies. Uh, Female Furies is a five or six issue um, somewhat outside of the canon DC series, uh, which is by Cecil Castellucci, uh, who I recommend greatly as a writer. Um, really, really nice person as well. It is a story of, um, Barda, the Furies, and Granny Goodness in a way that you never thought you would see, and it is entirely based off of Jack Kirby's uh, intended Female Fury series that he never was able to make. So that is where I'm familiar with Adriana Mello for. I will always hold her very, very close to my heart because that series was so honestly life-changing. Um, there's not a lot of things I would say about that in comics, but that that is one that has changed my, my perspective and my, my thought processes and um, my desire of things I want to see in comics. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> Adriana Mello is doing issues four and five of, of the Wonder Girl interiors. Uh, for the variants and the covers, Joelle Jones is doing issue three, uh, and issue four covers, but Jamal Campbell is doing the variant for issues four and five. Oh no, just issue four. And for issue five, Dan Mora is doing the cover instead of Jones. And the variant will be by Jenny Frizen, who you all know probably by now I am like bonkers about. Um, <laughs> Jenny Frizen is one of the few artists who I will buy a cover for whether or not I read the series. If it's just a cover that she does very well because I am a Jenny Frizen art collector for zone for whatever it is. It, you know who I'm talking about. Um, it's, as I said before, it's hard to say how long the series is going to go for. We do have solicitations up through issue five and it does seem like it's going to go beyond that. Um, at least into a sixth issue, nothing about the fifth issue solicitation makes me think that that's going to be the final one, but it does kind of seem like it might be wrapping up at that point. So I'm going to guess it's going to be a six issue series. But, you know, just thinking about that actually more now, um, the series kind of, I'm getting the vibe that it's going to end with Yara becoming Wonder Girl. Um, my voice is doing weird things, <laughs> but it, with that in mind, if that is true, it makes me think that there is going to be an additional Wonder Girl series after this, um, because clearly there will be a very large gap. Well, I guess it doesn't have to be, right? Because there is that CW Wonder Girl show. So I could be wrong, and that could be Wonder Girl 1 through 6 is the intro to the show, and then you see, or and, and her in regular DC Universe, and then you see her in the show picking up the Wonder Woman, you know, gauntlets or whatever, Bolo, I guess, and uh, being Wonder Girl. That's, that's actually, I didn't really think about that until just now. So it's, it's, it could possibly be that that is how this series is going to end, with just uh, the final issue is her becoming Wonder Girl, and then we're going to see her future before she becomes Wonder Woman on that CW show. Um, who knows? I, I could be it. I would prefer a comic because the CW has that reputation that they have. But yeah, anyway, we'll see how things go as time progresses, I guess. For America Chavez, made in the USA number four. This is number four of five. 
Um, it's by Kalinda Vasquez and Carlos Gomez. I have um, negative emotions, <laughs> as I have mentioned, I think, several times since issue three came out. Um, the first two issues of this, I was so, so head over heels with. Um, not only was it a new writer taking on America in a way that seemed to be so positive and just right, uh, we have Carlos Gomez, who I am a massive fan of. My husband's a patron of him. Um, just really great dude. Um, big fan of comics himself and of Spider-Man characters and stuff like that. So it's always fun to see his, his own art of what he does for fun and warmups and things. But, um, and he draws America so fantastically well. And I spent the first two issues praising the series for not only the creative team, but for the way that they were handling America. I, I don't know how many times I said it, but in my mind, the proper way to add stuff, anything really, to a character's history is not to go back and change things that are already established. It's to find a time and a place or whatever in their life that has not been explored and add stuff into there. And that can evolve the stories around it without having to remove, change, or drastically different, make it, just make it drastically different than what it was before. I spent so long praising the series for that. The first two issues. Um, by issue three, my foot was down my throat. Um, because they... Now, spoilers, if you haven't figured out, everything is going to get spoiled here. Um, <laughs> they basically decided to... Um, America has a sister, not surprising. Uh, we kind of always knew she was going to have this family that we would eventually learn about or something. Um thing is, <laughs> the sister has shown up to basically force America to remember that she's not from the Utopian Parallel. She is from a lab where a scientist dude put her on her sister because they were sick. So she just, like, as a kid, I guess, just, like, her brain, like, broke over that concept and just, no, we're aliens from the Utopian Parallel. We're from another dimension. And my mothers are superheroes. None of that's real anymore. Her moms aren't superheroes from another dimension, from a utopia. They're just these ladies who are married. And I'm sure they're, you know, you could say the thing about every mom is their child's superhero. First of all, that's bullshit. <laughs> um, second of all, that's not the same. Being an actual superhero, as it's not the same. And this is also something that, correct me if I'm wrong, but it makes America look stupid. She's been telling everybody for ages now that she's from the Utopian Parallel and another dimension and her mothers are these intergalactic lesbian superheroes and none of that's real now. And not because she was brainwashed or anything, because she just, she just forgot. Um, I just, I really don't like that. I really, really don't like that. I feel like it is doing nothing but harm to the character. Um, if you're going to change stuff about a character's history, for God's sake, make it a change for the better. Example, Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers, Kelly Thompson, it wasn't Kelly Thompson, it was the one whose name I always forget because I didn't like the rest of the series that she did for Carol on an, uh, Mar, Mar, Margaret something, Margaret something. Um, when she did Life of Captain Marvel, she revealed that Carol's mother is Cree, so therefore Carol is half Cree. Um, she also, by tying in things about the Cree lifestyle and how the Cree are a nation bred for war, um, that was how she was able to fix, I guess, Carol's origin so that the, the psych magnetron, the Kree machine that Captain Marvel, the original Marvel, um, he, he, they, they were there and they were encountering it and they were fighting Yon Rog, I believe it was. Um, and then the machine blows and Carol gets imbued because the machine, she was the, it was Marvel was between her and the machine, I believe. So she was imbued with his Kree powers. What Margaret, 
whatever her name is did here with the life of Captain Marvel and making Carol's mother Kree was that was not her powers are no longer something that came from a man or another person really it was something that was always within her that the psych magnetron triggered so while for ages she figured that she had gotten these powers from uh marvell it was actually her own strength so you can see how that's a positive change um and it doesn't really change much except for our idea of how she kind of came to be where for america right now they are changing um our idea of her grasp on reality, <laughs> um, what planet she came from, uh, her heritage, her stories that she has told us proudly are now fake. It just is not, it's not good. I don't see anything good about these changes. Um, hoping that this issue will make me again, put my foot in my mouth and I'll regret saying all that and whatever, but like, it doesn't look good from right now. The Good Asian number three, I have been so incredibly impressed with. Um, again, apologies for the mispronunciations that will be happening in just this moment, but this is by uh, Pornsack Pishishot and Alexandra Tifengui. 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 Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I tried. Um, really, really, honestly seriously impressed with this. Uh, it's, we have a variant cover to make things even better. Variant cover by Jen Bartel, which is showing uh, the character of Lucy Fong in this beautiful white dress. This is all, remember, back in the, what, 30s-ish? 40s, maybe? Um, I don't think it's the 20s. I think we're a little bit beyond that. But it's, it's back in the day, you know. Um, and it is following a Chinese-American detective. Um, who is kind of stuck between the worlds of the Chinese immigrants and the Chinese American who live in San Francisco here and the f white culture of, of, of the rest of America at that point in time. Um, that's the easiest way to say it. Uh, because if, you know, it's, it's something that is still going on now and something that has been honestly ignored until recently, I would say. Um, is there is a massive anti-Asian sentiment in the U.S. and it has been there since we were a thing. <laughs> um, there is a really bloody history with it too. So go watch Warrior on HBO. You get some really good insights with that and you also get a good introduction to the Tongs, which is being brought up here in The Good Asian because the Tongs were the Chinese... Um, gangs, basically, uh, that, that ran through San Francisco in the areas at, the t at that time. Uh, part of the plot in this is that there seems to be um, either the Tongs are making a return or there is just somebody going out there trying to make it look like uh, Chinese immigrants or Chinese Americans are killing white folks. Um, the first issue ended with our, our guy Hart here, our detective, um, discovering the body of a white man in a cellar of a Chinese family with a hatchet that was clearly used to kill him, uh, which is what the tongs would use to kill people. So um, that's kind of his concern, is that this is going to be really not good look for the community. Of course, he actually, um, he turns the family in. He In the second issue, we find out he turns the family in. So it's, it's very interesting to see how Hark, um, he, he is... He's not an Uncle Tom, but he is, um, and he is out here to help his own people, true, um, by being this detective and seeing the white man's world up close and being in it. But, um, he seems to have a good deal of, uh, negative outlook and resentment towards his own community. So, uh, it's, it's an interesting duality we're hitting here. And in the last issue, he re-encountered Lucy Fong, who I believe was a former love interest of his, who, um, I can't quite recall her role in it, but there was a massacre at the bar that he was at. That was a, um, it was like a crossover, integration kind of bar thing. It was kind of cool and kind of weird at the same time, uh, but it got massacred and he gets out and he runs into Lucy Fong. Um, this, this, 
The solicitation for this issue says, The surprises really begin as Hark encounters Lucy Fong's completely different perspective on Chinatown, one pivotal to stopping the hatchet man on the loose. Um, so Lucy is probably going to get in harm's way. He's going to have to save her. Um, please get the Jen Bartel cover for this because it is so beautiful. Um, the Good Asian, number three. I This is a great series. Wrapping up on its fifth of five issues this week, we have Carmen, number five, by Guillaume March. Once again, I apologize if that's not how you say it. Somebody please give me help with pronunciations. I'm terrible with it. Guillaume March is a Spanish writer and artist. He has been seen primarily over DC stuff, from what I can recall. Um, especially recently, Batman, um, and less recently the original Birds of Prey series, uh, no, excuse me, the original um, Gotham City Sirens series. Two very different things there, geez. Um, so that's that's very exciting. He's a very well-known creator. Carmen was originally published in Spanish, yes, but also as a graphic novel, meaning it was not individual issues published in a collected edition or released separately. So this is this for the American edition, or I guess the English edition here. They have, uh, it's being released through Image, and it is, um, it is, it is done, in, it is split up into five pieces, and as many people have noted when discussing the series, um, who are aware of its past of being an original Spanish graphic novel, they did a very impressive job of, of finding places to end chapters and issues. Um, they did a really, really great job of splitting it up and having it feel... It You wouldn't know that it's it was originally a graphic novel going from beginning to end without any breaks in the center. Um, you would not know that, because they did a very good job of finding those sto- those spots to put those stops. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the last issue... Oh, gosh. The last issue, it ended with the absolutely gut-wrenching reveal that um, the character Kata... While she killed herself, uh, in short, over the thought of her lifelong friend and more recently uh, crush, wanted nothing to do with her. He had been kind of separating from her and dating other girls and cheating on other girls with other girls and not really involving himself with her. And she ends up killing herself, assuming that he just wants to kind of cut her out of his life. Um, The gut-wrenching revelation. Oh my god. Um... We, we we find out, and she finds out, more importantly, she finds out that he had stepped back from their relationship as friends because he needed to come to the conclusion that he was in love with her as well. And then this day that she has killed herself, he goes and she's witnessing as, the, as a ghost him call her and leave a message and saying, I'm worried about you. What's going on? You know, I, I, I got to talk to you about something that's really important. Because he's trying to tell her he loves her and she's dead. Oh my god. It's gut-wrenching to the max. Oh my gosh. Um, and so uh, uh, th- through the past, you know, I guess all the issues, there's been this white light that's been following Kata around as she does her little ghosty things. Um, and the white light, as is explained by Carmen, her angel we learn is the white light you know it's it's the thing that you see that you go through the white light and then you're you're gone um so so basically meaning as soon as she is touched by the light that will be the end of her existence as a kata ghost or anything like that and she will go on as has already been explained in this series to be reborn in some way because that's uh what carmen explained to her was that you get a uh, reincarnation is, is the way that things happen. Um, and so Carmen, that was Carmen's whole goal with this was to take this young girl who had killed herself, this young woman, um, and show her enough positive and good things of life while she's a ghost. So that in her next life, she doesn't make the same mistakes of causing this tragedy around her own death. So, uh, the solicitation here, it says in the moving final issue of Guillaume March's gripping tale, the fate of Catalina's soul and body hang in the balance. Will she be given a kind of amnesty and be born anew as a better person? Thanks to Carmen's intervention, or will she be lost to herself and all that she loves, all those that she loves, including Zisco in this exhilarating 
genouement, an epilogue, we see what Kata's future holds for her. Uh, I'm really excited, as if you can't tell. Um, this is one I'm really excited to find out what's going to happen, as well as just finding out how this is going to end. Um, I, I know it's been out in Spanish. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't speak or read Spanish, so I don't know what happens. Uh, one thing also, um, it was originally published as a graphic novel. I'm kind of curious, it doesn't matter, but I'm kind of curious, maybe it will matter to somebody, I don't know, if they'll publish it as as a graphic novel itself or as the standard collected edition of comics in a series. Uh, whereas a graphic novel is page one to page end without breaks, the comic series collected is you still have the beginning and the end of an issue of several issues within that collected edition. Um, there are breaks. So I'm, I'm curious how they're going to do that with uh, the, the collected edition whenever that comes out for this. Um, but I, one more thing about Carmen, I know she's been naked in a lot of it. Um, Kata that is, has been naked in a lot of it. And I, I just um, body bodies aren't something to be ashamed of. Um <laughs> There is, there is absolutely nothing sexual or exploitative about Kata's nudity for when it has shown up in this series. Um, and if you feel otherwise, I can't help but say that you are probably projecting your own negative opinions on nudity and bodies. And I'm sorry you feel that way, but it gets better. Now, this will definitely be the most negative discussion of the comic book pull list this week. <coughs> the Avengers number 46. This is the start of World War She-Hulk. Um, while some of my concerns of this arc... Now, I don't... I have not been keeping up with Avengers. I did buy that reveal of Echo being the new Phoenix because I wanted to see who that was. And also it was awesome. And I love Echo. Uh, this whole heroes, whatever thing that has been happening is not even relevant because they're going straight from enter the Phoenix to this. So, <laughs> um, she Hulk, I know in she Hulk and enter the Phoenix was like, Everybody was, like, made crazy with the Phoenix Force and filled with greed and they just went wild and did all this killing and stuff and fighting. And She-Hulk was in Russia. Um, so I kind of get, like, oh, She-Hulk is... <laughs> Let me read the solicitation for this one, right? After the shocking events of Enter the Phoenix, the Earth has become more fractured and volatile than ever, especially for the Avengers. Once She-Hulk is declared a global menace, Russia's mightiest heroes, the Winter Guard, are tasked with bringing Jen to justice, to a fate, to face a fate no Hulk could ever hope to endure. Um, I, I don't know if this really works, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, I don't know. I feel like it's just kind of, um... It, it technically works with that she was in Russia terrorizing things. She was out of her mind, though, just as all the other people were. So are they getting treated the same way as her? Probably not. But I guess they're going to pick on She-Hulk because it's easy. <laughs> um, so, so, like, it kind of works. But at the same time, I'm like, I, I can poke holes in this for it all day, but... It, you, it's comics, so it kind of works. And comics, you know, you just have to kind of let things be. Um, that being said, it is super problematic that they're going to take She-Hulk and do this with her because, uh, yeah, sure, guys, sure. Let's, um, let's uh, take this character who has been evolved for the better over the past couple of years, in my opinion, and, and let's just run her through the goddamn ringer and see what kind of trash comes out the other side. Can we not do that? Can we just not? Um, can we have our female character? Well, just our characters. Let's just say our characters. Can we just have our characters, you know, be able to be happy for a minute? Just a minute. <laughs> um, and not be tortured just for fun. No fa a, f a face of fate no hope could hope to endure. What the shit are they going to do to her? This is ridiculous. So I do have, you know, I do have the solicitations for issues 47 and 48, which are going to continue the She-Hulk, the World War She-Hulk arc, right? 
So I, I guess the good side of this is that it's been revealed that it's not the Avengers who are prosecuting her. Um, making it the Winter Guard honestly doesn't make it really better because I feel like it's kind of making the Winter Guard look a certain way. Um, that is a little bit of a cliche about Russians that I'm not sure if that's really a great take, but you know, whatever. Uh, so issues 47 and 48, we have 47 says world war she Hulk rages on the red room is the secret furnace where some of the world's greatest assassins and super killers have been forged. And now she Hulk is its newest recruit as the Avengers race to rescue Jen Jen Walters from the Russian Winter Guard. Is it too late to save She-Hulk? Dot dot dot. From going red. So you, you start to see a problem here. Are they seriously going to brainwash her and make her Red Hulk for the Winter Guard? Like I said, can we not torture our goddamn characters? They don't need to be tortured to get plot development and character development. I promise you that's not the case. <laughs> Issue 48. Let's read this one, too. It says, uh, World War She-Hulk continues. After being taken prisoner by the Russian Winter Guard and sent to the notorious assassin training academy known as the Red Room, She-Hulk has been transformed into something terrifying. And now the Winter Hulk has been... Oh God. Winter Hulk has been unleashed upon the world. And the only one who can stop her is... Dot, 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 gorilla Man? Okay, I don't really care about the Gorilla Man part of that. Genuinely don't. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, torturing the characters and twisting them in their, in their minds like it'd be different if she legitimately decided to go and join them and offer herself up to that that's clearly not what's happening um yeah sure let's just let's just brainwash and and fuck up her head a lot more it wasn't those it was, wasn't bad enough that in 2016, she had to go through all that shit after Civil War II, uh, after her cousin got shot in, right in front of her by one of her exes slash worst enemy, frenemies, Hawkeye. Um, is a reason they don't get along. Um, and then she spent an entire series going over the PTSD of that. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! And almost dying at the hands of Thanos um, right at the beginning of Civil War II. She had, like, severe PTSD after that. There was a whole goddamn series by Marco Tamaki about it. And now you're just gonna put her through that shit again? Oh, I'm mad. Let's move on. We have also the Amazing uh, Amazing Spider-Man Annual number two. This is not a series, Amazing Spider-Man, that I read. My husband does. I do not. I'm aware of what's happening in it because of that. But I don't think what's happening in the actual... Uh, Amazing Spider-Man series right now is going to be super relevant with this tie-in. It is by Carla Pacheco and artist Eleonora Carlini. Um, and it's going to be featuring Star, who uh, is a character who was created by Kelly Thompson and Carmen Carnero for Captain Marvel. Um, she currently has the reality gem stuck in her chest. It's like bonded to her. I guess in a similar way that they're saying these other ones are bonded to them, although I have literally snoozed through every single Infinite Destinies uh, tie-in so far, including the Black Cat one, which was surprising. Uh, but I love Carla Pacheco. So, oh, it's not, I'm sorry, I said a few minutes ago that it was Carla Pacheco who did that She-Hulk series. It was not Carla Pacheco. It was someone whose name I'm blinking on. She's doing um, Detective Comics right now. Marco Tamaki. Yeah, it was Marco Tamaki. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Star was created by Kelly Thompson and Carmen Carnero, which is kind of cool because there is a Carmen Carnero variant for this issue, and she's a co-creator of Star, so that's kind of fun. Um, infinite. It is an Infinite Destinies Part 4, it says. Um, it says Infinite Fury, Spider-Man vs. Star. Like I said, I've kind of snoozed through all the Infinite Destinies ties tie-ins so far, but I am honestly genuinely curious to find out what is going on with the Infinity Stones. Um, so I'm keeping up with it, kind of. The solicitation here says, The next can't-miss installment of Infinite Destiny Saga is here. Spider-Man thinks he knows reality warpers, but he's never met Ripley Ryan. Mass murderer and occasional thunderbolt, Star is still searching for a path of her own, and the power to shape her future however she wants. But can the wielder of the reality stone really go up against a hero who's fought gods? Find out here, and get the next piece of the Infinity Stone puzzle. That's another thing. Um... 
she was in that Thunderbolts King and Black tie-in, which was goddamn horrifically bad. I do not re- do not read that. It was trash. Oh god, it was so bad. Um, but anyway, for some reason, the Star series she had her own series, and it ended with her getting um, a new look. She had red hair and a black and red suit. And now, ever since this Thunderbolts crap that was so bad, she's back in her original white and red with a blonde hair. I'm really disappointed by that because I think Kelly Thompson and Carmen Carnero did a fantastic job of giving her her own look as a villain. Um, And now they're back to this like, oh, I want to be a hero costume, but that's clearly not what she is. Um, As it says in the solicitation, she is a mass murderer. She really is. She tried to slaughter all of New York City to get their, like, life energy power. She is not good. (laughs) Um, But but I'm I'm curious what's going to happen here. The cover has her and Spider-Man looking, honestly, like, really friendly together. Um, Which is probably just a cute cover. I don't know, but... um, we'll kind of see how she lands on the hero to villain arc, um, or scale, I guess. Not really sure how that's, how that's going to be for her in the future. I liked her as a villain. I think it's perfectly fine to have your favorite characters as villains, as long as they're like, you know, backed up by good stuff and everything and solid material and writing and all that and characterization. But, uh, we'll see what happens with star, what Carla Pacheco has to do with star. And I am a fan of, a very big fan of Carl Pacheco, especially her Spider Woman that she's doing right now. Um, so I, I, I'm curious what she's, what her take of all this is going to be. Green Lantern number four. Um, it's by Jeffrey Thorne. In honest, all, all honest to goodness, I am reading this to see what's going on with Joe Mullen, who is the basically only Lantern left. Um, the solicitation here is since this is two stories, one is about John Stewart. And one is about Joe and the Teen Lantern and Simon Baz. Uh, So here's what it says. It says, improve, adapt, overcome. The same lessons John Stewart learned in the Marine Corps help him begin his quest to find the other lost lanterns in the dark sectors of space. Meanwhile, back on Oa, one of the Corps' newest members, Joe Mullen, alongside Young Justice's Teen Lantern and Simon Baz, tends to the wounded and investigates who or what caused the source of all Green Lantern's power to go nuclear and wipe out the Corps. Okay, I guess... I guess that is kind of interesting. I, I forgot I was... That last issue actually was pretty good. I forgot. Um, low expectations, but but it's going pretty well. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see Joe back in, you know, stuff after her Far Sector series has ended. And this pretty much picks up right after that. So that's pretty cool. We know that she's going to be a future Justice League member. Um, so hopefully we get... You know, I'm, I'm reading this for Joe for the most part, so hopefully we get Joe uh, continuing into, you know, whatever where, whatever it is that ends up having her be the future state Justice League Green Lantern, similarly to how I hope we do see that with Yara Floor. Um, we'll see, but this has been, this is a very, it's a nice little mystery here. The last issue before we get into the exciting number ones here is Hellions number 13. This is by Zeb Wells with art by Steven Segovia, who does a really fantastic job uh, with physical form. I, I'm very much enjoying his art. This issue is featuring Sinister's clone coming back with a vengeance. Um, I don't have too much to say about it, honestly. It's a fun... It's, Hellions has just been like a fun kind of side Dawn of X, Reign of X series. It's not... In, it's not integral for your understanding of what's going on, at least thus far. Um, it is the only place that Madeline Pryor has shown up in a, in a while. So if you want to see her read the beginning first couple of issues of Hellions, um, most likely she will re pop up again in Hellions because of the upcoming Inferno, um, event slash arc slash series, uh, whatever it is. Um, I'm really hoping to see her, back in action, um, soon. And I am kind of feel comfortable theorizing that she might pop up again soon, not just because of Inferno being announced, but because, uh, this is a Sinister clone. We, Sinister has all these clones of himself. We know this. We know this. Um, but we, there's all these rules that is so, (sighs) 
he made Madeline Pryor. So is it's so possible that he has more Madeline Pryors, but then the whole thing about she's not supposed to exist because Jean, and then other clones exist of like Wolverine and stuff, but it's it's complicated. Um <laughs> to say the to say the least. I just really want Madeline Pryor to show back up. That's it. All right, the number ones that we're going to be discussing this week are Fight Girls number one, Mama number one, Ordinary Gods number one, and X-Men number one. Let's start with Fight Girls. This is by Frank Cho, written and drawn, coloring by Sabine Rich, or Rich, I'm not sure, uh, however you pronounce it. There's a little bit of, um, a little bit of a funny, couple of funny things here. (laughs) Um, so obviously Frank Cho is a name that is very... Um, loved and hated among comics, the comics community. Um, he is very much known for his curvaceous female bodies, um, with good reason. He really does do a phenomenal job with drawing, uh, the female form, especially curvy female forms. Um, uh, and by curvy, I don't mean Kardashian. I mean properly curvy. Um, everything between, oh gosh, just, you know, fit superhero women with large assets to, um, Romanesque women, you know, who are a bit more, uh, fleshy and rotund, but he draws them in a very, very, uh, lovely way. So, Uh, A little bit of controversy over his art because of that. Um, If you're not familiar with the whole Wheat Cakes saga of his uh, sketch covers, I definitely recommend checking those out because they're pretty funny. Um, And he has also kind of embraced the hate that he gets. And he now, um, a lot of his stuff is like tagged with outrage is what he uses as a term to kind of make fun of himself or kind of uh, make fun of the people who actually do get outraged over um, him drawing beautiful women. (laughs) Um, So that's, that's one side of things. And yes, he, you know, he does, that's what he's, it's just what he's known for is just drawing beautiful, bodacious women. Um, And he's really, really goddamn good at it. He's so good at it. Uh, you can't, if you, if you try and say that he's a bad artist, I'm sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> you are just, you are factually incorrect. <laughs> um, but there is another thing to kind of also remember here. And that is that he does not really draw people of color, <laughs> which is pretty funny because he is an Asian American man himself. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, he, he pretty much primarily just draws white women. Um, even in the series, you will notice of the, however many 10 contestants or whatever that it is in this. Um, yes, it is 10 contestants. I believe they're all white. (laughs) Um, which is kind of funny because they're, they're battling it out for being queen of the galaxy. Um, so they're all white though. <laughs> Let's read the solicitation. 10 hardest nails women face off in an ancient contest of champions where the winner truly takes all the title of queen of the galaxy to win each cha- to win the challenge. Each contestant must survive the hazards of the planet's harsh landscape, the ferocious predators on, on and below its surface and their fellow contestants. This edition of the contestant of the contest has a twist. One of the contestants is an infiltrator who has her eye on something bigger than the prize. Who is she and what does she really want? All the solicitations that are out, issues one through three are up right now. Uh, All the solicitations are exactly the same. So there's no reading ahead of the solicits to try and get an idea of what's happening. And he even did, um, I believe he is even doing the cover for issue five, uh, a bit of a mishmash of faces. So you can't tell who the queen is going to end up being. I kind of have a feeling that it's going to end up being a bit dark where that queen of the galaxy role is actually going to be like something horrible. (laughs) Um, but I don't know. Uh, It's just, I happen to know that Frank Cho has a very, uh, dirty mind, (laughs) which is pretty understandable. (laughs) Um, but he's into like, uh, like, like one, one of his arts that he's very well known for is like, 
uh the the giant martian creature having the like the woman captive on her knees below him in chains so that's the, that's his kind of like when he creates his own stuff it tends to be kind of like that um so <laughs> i believe this is coming out from awa um i doubt there's going to be a whole lot of nudity in it but there's probably going to be a fair amount of um sexuality <laughs> I don't know. I could be totally wrong. It could be like the most serious thing he's ever done. We'll see tomorrow. Mamo number one. Ooh. Mamo number one. Not to be confused with Mambo number one. Or number five. Was it number one? Oof. Memories. Um, This is by, written and drawn and everything by Sass Millage. Millage. Sass? 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 It's probably Sass Millage. Um, S-A-S-M-I-L-L-E-D-G- E D G E. There we go. Um, this is one that I am interested in for a number of reasons. Uh, to kind of say all those in one blow, we'll just read the solicitation. It says, "Can Orla or Riley embrace her destiny in order to bridge the divide between humanity and the fairy world?" Orla, the youngest in a long line of hedge witches, finds herself pulled back to her hometown after the death of her grandmother, Mamo. Without Mamo managing magical relationships between the townsfolk and the fae, the seas are impossible to fish, the crops have soured, and Joe Manilow's attic has been taken over by a poltergeist. Now, Orla and Joe will both be pulled into worlds at th- worlds that they never... Huh. Worlds that they never wanted to be a part of. Can the two girls work together to save the town? Okay, so I had to stop for a second because I had to go back and reference. Who's Joe? It's Joe Manilow's attic has been taken over. Okay, got it. Got it. <laughs> um, witchcraft, very interesting. Fantasy comics, very interesting. Coming of age stories, very interesting. Um, bridging the divide between humanity and magical things or the mundane and the magical uh, very interesting. This seems to touch on a number of things that I've read before. I see a little bit of stardust in this. Um, I, I, it, it kind of touches on, and it actually, this the solicitation continues to say that it is good for fans of Sabrina the Teenage Witch or The Last Witch. I did not read The Last Witch. Um, and I'm not entirely sure if this is supposed to be an all ages series or what. Um, I will figure that out when I pick it up tomorrow. Um, but it, it really, it seems to fit really well into, um, into this fantasy world that I'm picturing. Uh, another thing, I just remembered another thing that it kind of reminds me of is the Terry Pratchett Discworld stuff specifically to do with, um, the We Free Men series about the young girl who is in, uh, she's in the chalk in like Ireland, I think it is, or Scotland. And she, her, her witch grandmother dies and she kind of takes up her position in the community as learning to be a witch. It's a very, very cool series. They're novels. Um, the, I, I do get a little bit of those vibes from this as well. So um, hoping to see that similar feel here. And I, I definitely think we will. Ordinary Gods number one is one that I checked out or will be checking out. Um, because it just sounds like such a delightfully fantasy plot. Where if, if the last series was fantasy, well, yeah, I guess they're both fantasy. I was gonna say if the last series was fantasy, this is sci-fi. But I can't really say that confidently because there seem to be quite a bit of fantasy elements in. <coughs> excuse me, just a solicitation. Uh, it is by Kyle Higgins and Felipe Watanabe. Watanabe. Um, The solicitation we will read here, the luminary, the prodigy, the brute, the trickster, the innovator, five gods from a realm beyond our own, leaders in a war of immortals, at least they were, before they were trapped, sent to a planet made into a prison, forced into an end, and forced into an endless cycle of human death and reincarnation. Christopher is 22. He's got two loving parents and a 12-year-old sister. He works at a paint store. He's in therapy. He is one of the five. Which means, in order to save everyone he cares about, Christopher will have to reconnect to his past lives and do the unthinkable. Become a god again. This does make me think a lot of the wicked and the divine, as I'm sure is very relatable. Um, It also, it brings up a number of... uh, reincarnation stories along the same lines. Um, there was something recently that also, oh, uh, Luna kind of touched on that a little bit. 
Um, Carmen obviously touches on reincarnation, not on the God aspect so much. But this is this is very interesting. I am excited to pick this up. Uh, the whole concept seems super cool, and I am totally down for it. Finally, to wrap up the comic book poll list, X-Men number one. This was, of course, Jonathan Hickman handing off his X-Men series to Jerry Duggan and Pepe Larraz with Marte Gracia as the artist. And yes, I did confirm through listening to podcasts, it is Jerry Duggan and not Gary, even though it's a G. So, go figure. Um, now I know how to say it right. Nice. The solicitation, I'll just read it first. These X-Men are dot 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 fearless dramatic Marvel. <laughs> the heroes of Krakoa are here to save the planet. Things might be complicated between the nation of Krakoa and the rest of the world, but to the X-Men, things are simple. You do what's right, you protect those who need protecting, and you save the world we all share. Cyclops, Marvel Girl, Sunfire, Rogue, Wolverine, Sink, and Polaris are the chosen champions of mutant kind, and they will not shrink from any battle for their home planet. Um... This has actually kind of brought up some funny thoughts for me, and that was, I don't think it's been a while. I mean, I do think it's been a while that since the X-Men have been um, involved with standard human stuff. Um, if you remember back you know, through the day, through the eras, there are often a lot of times um, where the X-Men, like periods like now, where the X-Men are kind of wrapped up in their own dramas and not really out there publicly, um, except for when their own dramas get pushed into cities and things. Um, there are, but, 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 but the rest of the time, you know, they were always known as, they were just another hero team. They were like the Avengers or the Defenders. They would just be another team to come through and help save the day if something's attacking New York City, or, as it usually would be. <laughs> um... And it's been a while since we've had that, unless I'm mistaken. So I'm very interested in how that is kind of being brought back. The team is super cool. Um, I also think that it's very interesting. You get, let's see, Sun. I would say everybody, yeah, everybody but Cyclops and Marvel Girl are probably a little bit less um, confidently admired by humankind. Cyclops and Marvel Girl have been... Oh gosh, so many teams in the public eye. Sunfire, Rogue, Wolverine, specifically Laura, uh, Sink, and Polaris. It's Polaris is a little bit uh, Rogue as well, but the, especially those other three really have not been involved with human society too much in in uh, them being mutant X-Men and everything. That really hasn't crossed over with their existence um, on the teams that they've been on and whatnot, if they have been on teams. Um, so I'm very curious to see, it says, in the solicitation, it says, um, you know, things are simple, you do what's right and protect people who need protecting. And I can't help but feel like a lot of these mutants have different priorities, um, and different ideas of what would be appropriate to kind of go out of your way to do or who, where they should be protecting most. I don't know. Um, that's just kind of my thoughts on it. Another thing that I wanted to mention was that the high evolutionary, uh, is going to be in issue three, which comes out in September. This is worth noting in my mind because there was a point in time where the high evolutionary was greatly involved with, if not technically the father of Scarlet Witch and and uh, Quicksilver. Again, I'm not entirely sure where they've left off with that history because it gives me such a headache to think about. Um, but I, I remember High Evolutionary was at one point their, like, daddy. <laughs> so I wonder, this being a thing that happens in September, I wonder if the, uh, the X-Men number three is going to tie into the Trial of Magneto issues at all, because that is going to be happening in August and September as well. And the Trial of Magneto, as we all know now, is going to be uh, the, the, the trial and the, the mystery surrounding the death of Scarlet Witch. So um, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver technically having this history kind of sort of with high evolutionary him popping up in issue three of X-Men around the same time that her like murder trial is happening. I don't know. Um, it might, it might be mentioned. It might be completely irrelevant. We'll have to wait until September to see. In any case, that wraps up this week's comic book pull list. 
Um, as always, if you did not see anything here that you really enjoyed, um, or if, you know, you, you want to get into comics and you're not sure what to do, please, please, please check out your local comic book shop because they'll be so happy to help you out in finding something that you enjoy. I do not talk about any of even everything that I read. It's certainly not everything that comes out. I, it's a fraction of a fraction of what comes out. So, um, there are all kinds of really great comics. There's things that I know are great that I don't read because I just don't have the time, um, so much good stuff and it's all there just waiting to be tapped in by you. Let's go ahead and start talking about Star Wars, The Bad Batch, Episode 10. This episode was called Common Ground. It was, I would say, not as good of an episode as the last one. I really, really enjoyed Episode 9 um, with what the fun characters that we had coming into it and everything were. Um, this was still a really good episode. Not not as good as 9. I still 9 is definitely my favorite uh, going around so far with the reveals and everything that we had. Um, so here in Episode 10... We find, well, we actually start off on Planet Raxus, which did appear at one point in the Clone Wars uh, series. Not sure at what point it was, but I, I do know that it appeared at one point. Um, and Raxus, in this point in time, as we're watching it in the Bad Batch, it was recently, uh, until recently, I should say, the center of the Separatist movement. Um, and now they're kind of having this little ceremony to celebrate martial law having been brought into uh, Raxus and the Empire and the clones and everything having been uh, successfully moved into the city is basically what they're celebrating here. Uh, this, the senator who is in charge of Raxus is Senator Avi Singh. Um, I know people were speculating about whether he would have been involved with like knowing Padme and stuff like that, but I kind of think that that's beyond the point um, with what we're working with in this episode. Uh, but Avi Singh, he immediately, you start to see that he is having some severe second thoughts about letting this whole martial law with the Empire thing happen, um, to their separatist people. So they clearly, the people don't want this. He just thought that it was the, you know, the thing that he should be doing to protect them or whatever. It's, what can you say? Uh, you have the Emperor, Emperor, <laughs> Imperial Captain Bragg is the the Empire's like uh, their person who is there with the this, doing the ceremony for the senator or whatever it is. <laughs> um, she gives her little speech and then Singh is meant to give his. However, when he is starts to give his speech, he starts to actually speak honestly about his regrets over letting the Empire into Raxus. But it's too late. The Imperial squads, as he is saying these words, the Imperial squads start to march, mar march, march in, including the clone stormtroopers, droids, and ATTEs, which are not ATATs. ATATs have not really popped up yet, as far as I think. I believe, at least the full size ones um, in Star Wars, they're doing the ATTEs, which are like the kind of shorter, bug like ones. Uh, Singh ends up sending his droid, who is called GS8, which is pretty funny. He's, he's a fun little guy. <laughs> he's not little, he's, he's human size, but he's fun. Uh, he sends him off to get his own agenda started, which uh, we don't really know what it is, but he's going off on Singh's orders to do whatever it is that, that, um, that Singh wanted him to do. And we find out that that is going to be sending a distress call to Sid, who uh, is the black market alien lady person who is currently I guess utilizing the Bad Batch because they owe her money <laughs> so she's sending them off on missions and things and that of course is where we catch up with the Batch in this episode uh, Sid wants them to do this job for her because they still owe her money, which is going to be an important thing um, in Omega's side of the plot so the Batch go off, they meet up with GS8 uh, they have an amusing time taking out the ATTEs and the troopers, um, and eventually they are able to rescue and get away with the senator. Um, but but more, I think, more interesting than that side of the plot was what happened when they were gone. While the Bad Batch was away, we got some really entertaining and useful plot lines from Omega. Um, she... There, there was a uh, a hollow chess board in the bar that Sid kind of runs, and 
she Omega gets intrigued with it. Now, hollow chess is something that goes all the way back to the original series when we see, um, I believe it was Chewie playing hollow chess in the original series. That was a criticism I know of, I believe it was the Force Awakens, how there was the bit of Chewie and the hollow chess. Um, people said that was fan service. I would just like to remind everybody that absolutely anything Star Wars that has come out post episode one is fan, not episode one, but you know, uh, uh, the new hope episode three, I guess four Ugh, math, um, anything beyond that first movie that came out is fan service. Literally everything continuing the, the, the universe is all fan service. The show existing is, is total fan service. Please stop bitching about fan service because you like it. You just like to pretend you don't. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so Hollow Chess has been a staple in the Star Wars universe <laughs> as like a Star Wars recognizable game, board game, I guess, <laughs> uh, for, since the beginning. Um, so first of all, obviously really cool that Hollow Chess makes its reappearance here. But even cooler than that is it turns out that Omega is bonkers good at it. Um, and she does some betting and ends up winning so many games of hollow chess that she earns enough money to win back all of the batch's freedom from Sid. Um, so that was really cool. Uh, it really, really proves how important she is for the team. Um, it wasn't a huge episode. It was definitely important in what was happening and expanded, you know, what we already know of the anti anti-empire anti black market just a little bit. And it, it definitely proved Omega to be useful, once again, she's. this is not the first time that she's proved herself to be useful in a pinch. While this was some place that they didn't even predict her needing her for, uh, she was able to find the need and fill it for them while they're off doing other work. So that was really, really good thing to see happen. Um, there was a cute line that a lot of people really loved at the end. It was between Omega and Hunter, who I still think is going to die a miserable death. Um, Omega, a, Hunter says to her, are you ready for this? And she goes, are you? <laughs> really cute. Um, she's clearly come into her own a lot, thanks to the batch. Um, we're probably going to see some more stuff on the people who are after her, uh, further on in the series. But for right now, they can kind of take a, take a second to relax because they've won their freedom back from Sid. Um, and they have, they're, they're, they're back to the free, I was gonna say the free ocean, the open ocean. It's, it's not, it's space, the open space, the open universe. <laughs> uh, there was also something else to note. There's two things that I wanted to note at the end of this. Um, the beginning of the episode on Raxus, there was really, really, genuinely fantastic effort put into the different aliens who are on the planet mingling, me meandering around and mingling, um, all different levels of closeness with humanoids. Um, we saw, uh, not Cad Bane, but, um, there, there was some bounty hunter person from the Clone Wars, who I can't remember his name. And we saw somebody from his species. We saw one of the new species that were introduced earlier on in the series, the people with the blue skin with the gold on them. They were new this with this uh, series. Um, a bunch of other recognizable alien species from other Star Wars properties. Really, really enjoy seeing that because it's such a big galaxy. Of course, there's going to be places like this that are actual melting pots of life from across all across the universe. Another thing that I wanted to note also, um, the batch, and I, I, I looked this up because it was something that I kind of noticed in that episode and I wanted to see if anybody else had, and it's actually a lot about it. Um, and a lot of theorizing and things about this. I, I think it's not quite as deep as some people say it's, it's worth noting the batch don't kill their fellow troopers. If they can help it, they use stun shots. That was what I was checking to see if I'm correct. If any, if any chance that they can, they will avoid murdering, uh, they will, their, their clone brothers. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to know that some people get really deep about it on the internet. I just think it's interesting because they, are basically aware of what it is that is making their fellow troopers go against them. And they're aware that it's not under their control, just like crosshair. What he's doing is not under his control. We did not see crosshair in this episode. Actually. Um, he did have that really, really horrible accident getting his 
a lot of his body severely burned um, by an engine. So he's probably just healing for this episode. And I have no doubt we're going to catch up with him uh, pretty soon and see what he is moving on to next to catch them. Uh, okay, to wrap up today's episode, um, <laughs> Hugh Jackman was trolled us this morning. Well, not trolled. I, 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 uh, he, he trolled some people this morning. Um, there was, I'm not a fan of boss logic. Um, I used to be a fan of boss logic, but, um, as you can see with the picture that Hugh Jackman shared this morning, he has sort of become, um, very lazy in my opinion, based on the, the arc that he used to put out. And I get, you know, you get to a certain point and you can do what you want. That's fine. But everybody freaks out whenever he posts any kind of edited anything. And half the time it's nothing special if more than half the time these days. Um, so Hugh Jackman shared on his Instagram stories this morning, a, um, boss logic edit of Wolverine, what he thinks Wolverine, it was just his arm. It was the arm of Wolverine in a leather suit. And I guess that was his like, Oh, look at this MC Wolverine design I made. It was just an arm with knives being held in the hand. Practically. I'm just a little bitter about how much people credit people give him for not putting in very much thought or effort, but to each their own, I suppose. <laughs> Um, but anyway, after Hugh Jackman posted that picture, he also posted in his stories uh, a photo of himself and Kevin Feige hanging out, I guess. Um, it was probably a red carpet or a press event or something. Um, but of course, the internet has done the internet's thing, and they are um, basically just assuming that this is Hugh Jackman confirming Wolverine's going to be back in the MCU. <laughs> I don't want that. I cannot be the only person who genuinely does not want that. Did you guys see Logan? You saw that, right? You saw what a perfect wrap up of his story that was. It was beautiful. It was perfect. That was the end of Hugh Jackman as Logan and Wolverine. And it was everything we hoped it would be and so much more. Do you guys really want to just ignore that? There's a reason that movie won Oscars <laughs> and I don't really respect award ceremonies, but when they include sci-fi stuff and fantasy and comic book stuff, it's usually for a good fucking reason. Um, and Logan deserved every award and more. Um, so, uh, there's that, and there's also the fact that Hugh Jackman himself has come out and explicitly stated that due to the physical uh, strain of it, he is no longer going to be playing Wolverine. He's been playing Wolverine for 20 years. Like, it was like 2000 or 2001 when he first started, when the movie came out. So, like, give the man a break. <laughs> um, I think what it was like, it was like 16 or 17 years is what it came out to being, but it's, it's like if he doesn't want to play Wolverine anymore, don't, don't make him. Um, what I think that this was because of course everybody is speculating what it means. I don't really think it means anything. Um, I kind of think that it was him going down memory lane, seeing this boss logic thing, of course, that he is Wolverine. So of course he's going to appreciate anything remotely cool Wolverine. So he reposts it and then he thinks, wow, yeah, that's pretty cool. I'll find me this picture of myself and Kevin Feige from when we were hanging out at that thing like a year or two or three or five ago. Cause I don't think it's a recent picture. I could be super wrong, but I really don't think it's a recent picture. And so he just like posted that as like, yeah, it's related to the other thing. I don't think it was him trying to tease anything. I don't think they're going to be starting off the MCU with Wolverine. Uh, especially since that is what literally what the Fox men movies did. Um, but you know, I could be wrong and I would hate that about this because I don't want Hugh Jackman to come back as Wolverine. Don't get me wrong. There will probably never be a Wolverine better than Hugh Jackman, but I don't want him to come back. He wrapped that up with such a perfect little cherry and bow and, and oh my gosh, why would you want to undo that? <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess, you know, if you have another reason to think that this might be real, let me know, because I really don't think that it's real. I mean, it's real. He posted it. Just I don't think it means anything is what I'm saying here. 
Anyway, on that odd note, that wraps up this uh, week's Monday, or rather, sorry, Tuesday episode of Sensational She Geek Live from Yancey Street. Once again, I do apologize that this episode showed up a day later than it normally would. Um, I will hopefully be able to warn you guys about any more of those uh, delays or anything like that in the future. I did not think that the weekend was going to get away from me so much. Uh, Unfortunately, it did. And that is why this episode is on Tuesday. So thank you for listening to whatever portion of the episode that you listen to. It is available where all podcasts, anywhere that podcasts stream besides Pandora, including YouTube. I have them all linked on my website. I also have my new Patreon linked on my website. Uh, If you you can just search it on Patreon, Sensational She Geek, it should be there. If you run into any issues with that, please, please let me know so I can go ahead and troubleshoot what to handle, what to do with it. Um, And my next episode, we're going to have it back on Friday the 9th. Now, here's a thing that's important to remember. Wednesday the 7th, that is tomorrow, we have Loki episode 5. It's going to be episode 5 of 6. It's probably going to be a longer episode based on the 6-hour time span that we're expecting this whole series to go. Now, also, Friday the 9th, Black Widow will be up in movie theaters as well as on Disney Plus with Premiere Access. Please don't bitch me about that. I've explained why that's a fair enough thing for them to be doing already. Moving on. Uh, I will be watching that Friday night for sure. Uh, However, I will not be reviewing it until Monday. Um, My Friday episode will be up Friday morning. I don't have anything crazy happening this week. I might be moving this weekend, so that's exciting. Um, So fingers crossed there, but... Uh, my Black Widow review will be on the uh, the twelfth, and my Loki episode five review will be on the Friday episode, the ninth. So go ahead and keep an eye out for those. Also on that Friday episode, I will be discussing my comic book picks, things that I found to be good, fun, interesting, or relevant somehow from this comic book pull list, or whatever else I managed to pick up from the comic book shop. Again, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Sensational She Geek Live from Yancey Street. Uh, I'll be back Friday with episode 25B. I am after, I am post 50 episodes here, so go us. Thank you for listening and for supporting the podcast in whatever way you can. It is summer. Stay cool, stay hydrated, and stay sweaty.